Yes. Well, uh, welcome to Nice Moves, our May meetup. Uh, we normally have these things at the end of the month, but uh, Mike Owens got his way. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, May 14th, the first very beautiful day of the year. So as uh, soon as I'm done talking, I'm going to split. Uh, but seriously, thanks to all of you for coming here. And I know it is super nice. That's all I can think about now. Um, we really appreciate you coming here, and I'm sure all these people really appreciate it too. We appreciate them coming. They're going to be talking about, um, let's see, what is it? Let me look at our fancy uh, nicemoves.com. Failure and persistence, developing and pitching a story. But first things first, we have nice news. Just uh, kind of events that are going on. Oh, wait, back up. What is nice moves? <laughs> <laughs> Nice Moves cultivates an inspiring and diverse motion community in the Twin Cities and surrounding regions. Uh, basically, we started this thing about two and a half years ago because there was a, it was kind of a fractured community and it really does brighten my heart to see all different people here from studios, students, TV, film, it's really amazing. So thank you, round of applause to everybody. Um, we promised that we were giving away an I.O. ticket tonight. Who's excited? <laughs> Thank you. You saved my butt. Um, because if you weren't excited, we'd have to take it back. But here's the thing. We forgot the raffle tickets. <laughs> so save your excitement for tomorrow when we post a Facebook thing in our Facebook group. Uh, just give us your name and your favorite color of eyeball and <laughs> what else uh, your favorite um, what else is an eye I don't know pokemon. your favorite Pokemon with eyeballs <laughs> are there eyeballless Pokemon gross <laughs> oh that was very this good group, that was All right, I'm afraid we got off topic. Um, that never happens here. Anyway, IO ticket giveaway. Look out for that tomorrow in our Facebook group. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So next month, we just confirmed that we are going to have Josh Stifter. Um, and it's going to be called Uniquely Independent Working Title, because he just now heard that for the first time. <laughs> I'll but go that, with it. Yeah, that's not yeah. bad. I'll take it. <laughs> that's Josh Difter. He's going to be talking about um, his road from in animation school to ending up on a Robert Rodriguez produced television show where he had to make a feature length movie for $7,000. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, uh, that's going to be at the end of June. So you have to wait a little bit, but that just means you'll get to enjoy the nice weather. See, I'm still stuck on it. Um, so events, we got events coming up. Mm, which is on this page that I already pulled up. Pixel Farm is having a, a virtual reality night this Thursday, so in like two days, at uh, Bauhaus House Brew Labs. Uh, do you know what that's about? To? No, okay. <laughs> uh, you go there, get drunk, and then you Trip out in a VR world, I guess. <laughs> I heard a hell yeah. Uh, Art of World is this weekend. Perfect weekend for Art of World. Uh, just announced this morning, After Effects User Group is having a meetup. Um, let's see, May 23rd, it says right there. And they're going to talk about working faster in After Effects. I'm just waiting for their follow-up, working slower in After Effects. <laughs> it's okay if I entertain myself more than I entertain you guys. Uh, Stop Motion Workshop, I think it's almost full if it's not already full. I'm signed up. If you're interested in Stop Motion at all, check it out. IO Fest, we talked about that. Um, but seriously, IO Festival is a, it's like an arts and technology uh, conference. 
So they, there's one panel that I'm really interested in. It's called, um, uh, I don't know what it's called, but it's about creative coding where they perform music and do visual motion graphics live as they code it. So it's like they write a line of code and then some cool stuff happens there and then here and then they write another line and it's like, whoa, it's changing all the time, that's crazy. I thought code was boring. <laughs> uh, Catalyst, that's coming up, but I will let these guys talk about that because, yeah, you're gonna talk about that, right? All right, cool. So that means we can get to the free money. I don't know if anyone was here last time when I was talking about free money, but there are th three grants available that we know about right now. Um, let's see, this one is up to 15 grand, uh, the Flies Collective Film Grant, and then we have one here from the Minnesota State Arts Board Artist Initiative Grant, that's up to 10 grand, and the Glass Animation Grant Program, that's 2,500 bucks. And they, they are looking to fund a short animation projects I imagine some of you have some of those in the works. And if you, you know, need to eat or uh, pay the bills, don't put that in your budget, but between you and me, I won't tell. <laughs> um, and then we have here, right here, oh no, too far, too far. The last television animation show ever ever <laughs> all right Michael you plant I mean I've never seen this person before in my life um, open call the deadline is June 2nd if you're not familiar Hellevision is a really no holds barred crazy wacky animation throwdown does that help at all no okay it's, uh, you know, no inhibitions, just make something. That's it, just make something. It has to move though. That's the one rule. Oh, tough crowd tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what it is. I got you thinking about the, the outdoors. Yeah, there you go. Um, I'm getting the wrap it up signal, so. We have show and tells. We actually have four tonight, which is really amazing, because the, the four is more. No. Come on, guys. <laughs> First up, we have Tony Mills. To start talking while he's setting that up. Hi guys, I'm Tony Mills. I work at Pixel Farm downtown and I am a flame artist and visual effects supervisor and lead visual effects artist. Um, I'm excited to be here tonight because we have a story, um, me and a group of people here in the community, that we're trying to pitch ourselves and I'm eager to share it with you guys and learn from tonight from what's how to refine this pitch and take it forward and pick, perhaps get this idea funded. So, uh, Yes, I'll speak. Speak over here. Sorry, guys. I wasn't loud enough? I'm hard of hearing. Yeah, just That's cool. All right. So in 2017, I was approached by a local director, Jeff Stonehouse, and uh, writer, author, comedian, Mystery Science Theater 3000 alumni, Mary Jo Peel, about uh, trying to help develop a series that would rely on old public domain footage to uh, come up with some clever writing and visuals that would create new stories for a modern audience. And I personally have been obsessed with like uh, just old films, Edward Mybridge and the early motion studies 130 years ago. I've been making centaurs out of stuff in books. And um, this is a perfect opportunity to take these musings of mine, things I make for myself, and do something a little more directed. So in the first bucket of footage that we looked, like, looked at, there was a clip of a cowboy duo doing rope tricks in a nightclub. And as I watched it, I wondered if I couldn't do something with it. So
so I don't, there's no audio on this, but. I came up with like a rope alphabet and tracked it onto the rope and it was like weirdly interesting. It looked like code to me or something. So we came up with the idea that uh, this character was a secret agent and this gobbledygook was actually cowboy code to send messages during World War II. So here's the elevator pitch. In 1939, just prior to the start of World War II, American spy masters sent a cowboy couple to Berlin who could spell with their lariats. In, attempt to pass, in an attempt to pass coded messages to secret agents and stem the tide of war. Their marital spats, however, spilled over onto their stage act and it did not turn out well. And here's an excerpt, I hope the audio plays. Now, General Marshall sends Smiling Bill and his wife, Mrs. Smiling Bill, into Berlin. This is 1939, and they are supposedly touring nightclubs. It's sort of a goodwill gesture, but it was only cover for the project. So these cowboy coders embed their message directly into their rope language. It goes out directly to the cabaret audience, which is filled with operatives, and no one is ever the wiser. But it didn't exactly go without a hitch. <laughs> Smiling Bill wasn't that good of a speller, so Madge had to jump in and take over. Women are usually better spellers anyway. So this concept is to kind of rewrite history with old public domain footage and with the help of humor and some visual effects, make some new American myths. And so um, thanks for your time. You can find us on Facebook. The show is called America Obscurious. And you can find us on Facebook, and I'll just leave you with a little teaser clip of some of the ideas we have for stories we might try to tell going forward. had a giant chicken before Mike had a giant chicken. <laughs> My name is Ari Carrillo. Uh, sometimes people pronounce it as Gorilla, but I'm, I'm good either way. Um, this is my first time here uh, visiting this amazing, amazing group. Uh, Michael Wolf, I, he's one of my coworkers, and he invited me to come over, and I said, heck yeah, let's do it. Um, so this is me. I'm originally from Mexico. I moved to the States uh, almost 20 years ago, lived in Flo uh, Utah, then Florida, and then I found a teaching position at Brown College um, back in 2007, so I moved to Minnesota, and nobody, I moved in the summer, so it was a very, very nice, humid weather. Um, I enjoyed later uh, negative 16 Fahrenheit in January, and that wasn't nice, but uh, people are super, super nice, something that I didn't experience too much in Florida. Uh, but anyway, this is some of the work that I do.
So yeah, I moved to Minnesota. I was a um, instructor at, uh, for game design and 3D animation at Brown College. Uh, later they closed. And then I found a job at um, Axonom as a 3D modeler over in Eden Prairie. And recently I just um, started working for Justin's over in Eden uh, as a generalist, doing a little bit of everything. And on my spare time, um, I worked on a uh, 3D platformer, nonviolent game here with a friend of mine from from school. And this is just kind of what the game looks like. The idea behind the game is that it's a uh, non-violent musical 3D platformer where the point of the game is to wake up the world um, around you. Um, I worked in the, um, creating all the visuals for the game and the gameplay mechanics of the whole, uh, every level. Uh, and my friend worked on the programming and music creation for the game. It took us uh, three years to work on it because it was a part-time kind of hobby for us and uh, another year to find a publisher. And finally, th this is the fifth year and it's coming out on all consoles in the fall. Uh, once again, thank you so much for having me. This is amazing, thank you. Next up is Leighton Nosbush, and <laughs> and friends. Hey everyone, I'm Leighton Nosbush. I'm Jerilee Tilkey. And Kevin Peterson. And we're all part of a team that was at MCAD, and we have been working on a short film for a little over a year now. It was us and two other people who weren't able to be here tonight, but um, this f film kind of came into concept about a year, a little over a few, year and a few months ago, and Catherine started it um, doing the storyboarding, and we all sat down and talked about what we wanted it to be, and um, let's just show the film, and we can... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's been a long process, but we're really, really excited to have it done, and it's definitely something that um, we all learned a ton from all working in different aspects, and we were all able to do, kind of work as a little team of specialists during this film, which is kind of unique, especially um, when a lot of our other projects, we've all been working as generalists, so we were able to kind of refine our skills there. So, yeah. <laughs>
and just to wrap things up, it was primarily a team of five of us doing this whole thing while we were going to school, going to all of our other classes, and at, every single one of us was also working a job during the majority of this project, um, but it'll be up at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design for the duration of this week. We have an installation, it's in a little circus tent, so it shouldn't be hard to find if you're uh, able to go out there and see it. Otherwise, it'll be up there and you can find all our names and websites from um, the Nice Moves link to it. So thank you. And see in progress work, there are bloopers. <laughs> <laughs> Last up is Grace Rabine. Hi. So I thought that since I'd be here talking to you guys about my pitch, I should show you the kind of trailer I made as kind of a second part to my senior project uh, at MCAD. So I'm going to go ahead and play it since you'll hear all about it later. in a little bit. Uh, I have a whole pitch that went along with it, so yeah. <laughs> um, so next is what you all came here to see, the panel. Uh, is, is someone driving? Okay. Mike Owens, everybody. Uh, all right. I'll try to pull this together. Um, so we got a lot of people, a lot of information to talk about um, pitching and developing an idea um, to a series uh, or pitching anything in general. Um, we're putting everyone, we got 10 minutes for everyone to sort of give us their spiel and their experience. Uh, it'll help you to understand what 10 minutes really feels like and how much information you can get in 10 minutes because usually at a pitch, that if you're lucky, that's what you get. Uh, 40 of a minute, 40 minutes is small talk, bullshit, talk about weather and LA traffic, uh, and then you pitch and then you leave. Um, so, uh, failure and persistence is uh, reason we call it that because that's pretty much the things I've learned over the experience of doing pitching or doing animation or any of this stuff at all is being okay with failure and then persisting in face of failure. Um, so. Uh, I'll give a quick intro to everybody as soon as I know where I put my phone. Um, so this panel, this pan the idea of this panel is to talk about pitching, but it's also from a variety of point of views of people at different um, stages of development, different stages of their career. Because um, I didn't want to come here and, you know, I made Danger and Eggs, therefore I know the magic secret and how to do everything. I don't. Um, and I want you guys to know that there is no magic bullet for this thing. There's certain protocols. There's um, ways to approach this. There's ways to talk, uh, prepare yourself 
Um, but I do not have, have all the answers, so I reached out to uh, some local people that are creators um, to share their experiences. So that's what this whole thing is going to be about. Um, we will, sorry, yes, 10 minutes, go ahead, start. Um, uh, and so what we're going to do basically is we're going to go around, talk about what each of us are doing, a little experience of our stories. Um, we'll follow that up. Uh, Wendy and I put together a template for a pitch um, just to give you a starting point because the whole thing of failure and persistence that um, you probably will fail the first time out. Danger and Eggs failed for six years before it got picked up. Um, it's, you know, went from idea of egg coming out of chicken's butt uh, to the pitch um, and that took six years just to get to this pitch that worked on somebody so persistence and failure uh, DD didn't exist before so just this idea getting used to that put it out there because um, you'll definitely fail if you don't even start making your ideas into a workable document that can get into the circle of people um, that might want to look at or might want to fund it or green light or whatever it might be um, we can talk about how those opportunities come up, um, but the whole idea is to uh, just suck it up and start doing it um, because there is no complete magic formula, but uh, you're going to want to get it out there, have that feedback. It's going to evolve. It's called development for a reason because you develop it as you go, um, but having a document that actually works in the situation for uh, pitching to uh, an executive or to a client. Um, I think it's important for all of us as this community is growing here uh, to start thinking about that and doing that. We've had two shows, animated shows made here. There's a lot of production going on. And uh, the one thing we'll talk about at the end is this Catalyst Film Festival, which is an opportunity to pitch. And it's this festival for independent creation of series work that's going to be in Duluth for the next five years. So we'll talk more about that at the end. Um, so uh, where am I at? I'm 10 minutes. Did I already do it? Oh, yeah, I'm so good. Um, so um, I was going to introduce everybody, and I will still do that. Um, but I just, uh, uh, well, I'm just going to do that, because I think some of these other notes are going to come up into place. So, um, well, there's me. Uh, so uh, Wendy and I are, are in the middle of starting our company called Womo Studio um, with, for the stuff that we're pitching and developing. Um, so that's Wendy. Uh, over there is Sari Sambia Huskin, who is a director uh, on Danger and Eggs, also Emmy Award winner, and has started Tackle Box Tune Company, right? Um, and then we, <laughs> yeah. And then we have, uh, we all just met Grace, a student, um, but already at a point where she has a pitch and has a clip, so I just, uh, it's very exciting to see someone at that le uh, level of school still putting a pitch together. Um, so this is why we I want to invite Grace along. Um, Josh, you heard a little bit about. Um, Josh has pretty great career, pretty guerrilla, independent, let's make stuff no matter what kind of person. Um, as is Michael Hegel, who's been around. And most of you probably have know on some level if you've been in this town at all. Um, uh, teacher, filmmaker, effects person, animator, all around. Uh, Andrew George and John Wilinski were. Uh, artists and they worked on Danger and Eggs, uh, storyboard artist and revisionist. They also worked on 12 Forever, the Netflix show that came in. Um, and everyone up here has something that they're developing or pitching, so we're going to kind of walk through and uh, tell our stories um, and give you some, hopefully some useful insight uh, followed by a question and answer. Uh, so, uh, Womo Studio. Um, after Danger and Eggs, and this is the whole thing of failure and persistence. Danger and Eggs uh, made, you know, had a crew here, made it, went really well. We got an Emmy for directing. People really like it. I have no guarantee if it's going to go to a second season, and I have no guarantee that someone's going to pick up another show for me. I thought it would be super magical. It's like, I want an Emmy. Now I'm going to make any show I want. Uh, not true. So, like, just know that, like, at any level, you still have to work for it, and you still have to um, put in the time and the thought and the preparation. Um, which I'm not getting distracted. Yes, so with that in mind, the idea of like, could this, uh, I don't know where this is going to go next. I can't rest on the laurels of Danger and Eggs. So uh, Wendy and I have been uh, writing stories together and designing stuff for years. Um, Wendy decided it was uh, to leave uh, your full-time job so that we can just commit to pitching and developing, and we're working on a film. 
Um, when we pitched, when Danger Nag was pitched, I was not in the room in LA. Shaddy, the other co-creator, Shaddy Petoskey, was um, out in LA, and the, the importance of being in the room and pitching your idea. Um, we had not done that yet. Like we've always been the people doing the artwork and not the person in the room. So we had to figure out how to do that. Getting, although the getting the Emmy and having the show didn't guarantee me a show, it was super easy to get meetings for a while. So I took a bunch of them as much as I could. Um, so as we're becoming the people in the room pitching the thing, putting our ideas together, um, we had to collaborate to uh, how do you get these best ideas out here? And I'm notoriously uh, bad at just vomiting every possible idea, every backstory, um, and working with Wendy because we know each other so well and tell each other stories, uh, you brought in how to simplify it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so it's super important to know the backstory of everything. That's where the well you draw all your ideas are from, but um, coming into a story that you know really well and trying to tell somebody else, you have to start at the beginning. You can't start five years down the road of knowing everything. So um, a lot of what I have done with a lot of these things is, is to edit down so you have um, the shortest, most concise story that you can. Yeah, because it's, um, the thing is like that, I think that notion of it's been in your head for so long and I'm sure all of you have had this experience before, but until you put it out there and bounce it off someone who knows nothing at, about it, um, it could seem super clear and brilliant to you, but if it's not the, having the same effect on strangers or someone you trust their feedback, then you need to rework it. So finding that, that core of simple words that really gets, words and images that get to the, the core idea of your concept that you're trying to sell is an art in and of itself. Um, but we, we've changed it how many times since we started pitching uh, three or four times? Like. Well, like, at first, you know, when he started getting these meetings, he was like, we have to do 20-page pitches for everything. I need to let them know everything there is to know about this. So we ended up doing one postcard for each one of the ideas, which ended up working pretty well because yeah. a lot of times, you know, it goes in cycles of what they're looking for, so. And they're looking for so much and they're seeing so much, so if you, if I put all of my energy into one giant pitch and they're like, meh, I've seen a show like that, what else you got? I better have what else I got handy. Um, and as we were feeling out these studios, um, Wendy came up with this idea of a, a printed postcard, um, image on the front almost looks like the movie post, like a movie poster, on the back a synopsis and our contact information. I could spread them out on a table as I was meeting with people and run through them really briefly and they would say, oh great, tell me about these two and they would slide those two cards forward. So I was gauging what their interests are as well because you're essentially finding a partner. Like, don't be intimidated because they're Hollywood people, they're people with jobs doing their thing and it's getting over the, the, the anxiety and being comfortable talking about your project and the best way is to be prepared, be simple and know it. Um, the best you can. And practice. Two minutes, okay. And practice. Um, don't un uh, never underestimate the idea of um, pretend you know, your, your roommate is an executive or your mom or whatever it is. Someone who's gonna be honest with you because um, you need to know how it, how it sounds to everybody else. You need to be able to answer questions that might come up about the pitch, about the character, about the world, about you. Um, you're also pitching yourself as a creator to uh, an executive or whoever you're, you're a funder or whatever. Um, it's a relationship you're building as well as selling an idea. So that clarity, that brevity, that making it stand out, um, and remembering that you that they're seeing thousands of these things through the week. You have, you're coming in with one or two or three. So deal with the heartbreak if they're like, meh, we have seven Yeti shows this year, we're not going to take yours. Then write something else. You know, but it's about to get it out there so that you know that because if you decide I'm going to spend the next 10 years perfecting this pitch before anyone sees it, it, you've wasted too much time. Get it out there. Trends change. Executives change. Jobs. Um, moods change. Get into the circle of it and into the ether as quickly as possible. 30 seconds. Oh. Oh, and get, get find, your, find your team that will look at your stuff and 
give you honest feedback. Yeah, those people important. that you trust with, with your work. And, the, you know, the, the thing is, like, don't ask anyone, is this good or bad? Ask them if it's clear. Uh, start there. Because if it's not clear, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, because that, that becomes objective at a certain point where what someone thinks is funny or not. But is it clear is your first goal and the first question you should ask anyone that's giving you feedback or help. Perfect. Uh, we did it. Okay, with, uh, that's where we're at with uh, Womo. So talk, uh, introduce Josh with uh, Flush Studios. So go for it. Right on. So that was really interesting because I had very similar like ideas of going into that and then almost exactly the opposite of some of those things happened. So to start at the beginning really quick, I'll talk more about this next month when I kind of tell the whole backstory of how I went from animation, guerrilla style by myself because no one else would make films with me to on my 31st birthday going, you know what, screw it, I'm going to go make a feature film and failing miserably. And then within a year getting on Robert Rodriguez's television show Rebel Without a Crew to make a feature film for $7,000 with Robert Rodriguez. I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is how I got on that show right now and the pitch I made. So I got in front of the showrunner of Rebel Without a Crew by sending two random animations that I had made to El Rey Network, which is Robert Rodriguez's channel. I was a huge fan of Robert, and I actually ended up getting Michael Parks, who's an actor in a lot of Robert's movies, to do a voice in one of my cartoons. It's actually the last thing he did before he passed away. And I was like, I want Robert Rodriguez to see this thing, because I think it'll be important to him. So I sent it. He didn't really care about that animation. He liked the other one I sent and wanted to buy that. So I flew out to LA and went to El Rey Network and they bought the, the cartoon to play on their network. And while I was there, they said, hey, we've got this show we want to do where we, we have five filmmakers make a feature film for $7,000 based on Robert's book. Does that sound interesting to you? Have you ever done live action? Could you do an animation for $7,000? And I was like, I had no, but I could, I could do a live action stuff. Here are some of my shorts and, and whatever. And I didn't hear back for forever, for months and months. And then suddenly I got an email one morning that said, oh, by the way, did you ever prepare that pitch for us that you were going to send? We need it by noon. And I was like, by noon? Like, I, I, I had told them that I had some scripts that I've been working on or whatever, but I didn't have a $7,000 script that I could do. So I got the email at 7 a.m. I check my email when I first wake up. I'm laying in bed, and I'm like, we need it by noon. <laughs> we need it by noon! So I jumped out of bed and went and grabbed a camera and a bunch of random items I had laying around the house, and I took a photo of them. And I slapped a name on it that I thought was interesting, The Good Exorcist. I've been talking about doing a doing an exorcism comedy for years with my buddy Daniel, but we'd never like really, really thought it through. I just thought it'd make for a low budget movie because of the fact that a priest, it's one costume. Like I don't have to change his costume. Like that's, that's the only reason why I was like, this could be a cheap movie. So it was either that or making my buddy Daniel, who was gonna be in the movie, a clown. And I was like, I am not doing makeup every morning. So. The Good Exorcist became the thing. I took this photo at about 7.15 that morning, and I had to get to work by 9. So I snapped this photo of all these items I had laying around. I'm like, well, Robert likes guns. I got this, this flask with a mustache. I don't know how I'm going to work that into the movie, but what's that? No, the gun is a fake prop gun that I had bought for the movie that I failed at two years before. So I just grabbed props from other movies and started slapping them on a table that we had. So that's the table that's in my living room, actually. Um, I put together the, the graphics, the Good Exorcist logo, and a fake credits at the bottom uh, while I was riding to work on the bus. And while I was doing this on the bus, you know, everyone's looking at me like, what the heck is he doing? And I'm thinking about, like, I got to put together a pitch still, a photo isn't enough. Like, I need to have an idea for this movie. So I got to work about maybe 25, 30 minutes before I had to start, and I just threw together two pages of random synopsis, sort of. <laughs> Characters that just popped into my head, like, they changed so much from what the final product was. There's characters that are entirely different. In fact, at the bottom it says Maria, and it says something about her maybe being in love with the priest, but his response is, 
something like my lady is the church ma'am. I can't really read it up there, but <laughs> something like that. If you guys want to see any of this too, um, it I says printed, my old lady is the church. My old lady is the per is the church ma'am. <laughs> so just these crazy ideas that I came up with, a general synopsis, and then some scenes based on things I knew I had laying around the room or that I could do. I like little monster movies. So I was like, what kind of practical effects can I do? I'm like, well, my wife has this pink teddy bear that I always wished would like grow fangs and eyes would glow. So I'll write something about like a vomiting teddy bear that attacks the priest. <laughs> so it says vomiting teddy bear up there, um, a vicious Bible. Um, I came up with like a random opening sequence and I had developed this stock, this super eight footage for another movie, it was like an After Effects kind of plug-in that I made. I'm like, well, I'll just say that because if they ask for a proof of concept, I have that footage ready and I can just go film something with Daniel quick. So I sent this and I was like, there is no way they're going to take this. I just slapped this together in two and a half hours. And I, I'm imagining, you know, people are sending in full scripts to Robert Rodriguez that are $7,000 scripts, but I had to take that risk and I'm like, you know what, the worst case scenario is I'm gonna get, a, I'm gonna get nothing. The more likely scenario is Ryan Crow, who was the showrunner that I had talked to, is gonna call me and be like, dude, seriously? <laughs> like you realize people are sending in like 35 page proof of concepts, they've got trailers cut, you sent us three pages and a poster that you obviously filmed in your <laughs> living room. Literally the opposite happened. Like I got a call, a couple days later that were like, we need your script ASAP. I didn't have a script, so that, that's a whole other story for a different time. But the thing that I learned was, uh, what, how much time do I have? Four minutes. The, the thing that I really took away from this was putting it out there. Like not having that fear that what you're gonna do is gonna be looked at as garbage. Here's the thing, I realized most people most people will look at something, average people will look at something and go like, that's amazing that you at least made something. Especially at the level of, in, you're, you, they don't know what you've made, they don't know what you're doing, just show them what you've done and be excited about it. For me, that was the biggest thing with this. The thing that got me in the door was my excitement about the project. I never went, $7,000 in 14 days, that's impossible. I was like, I mean, I shot the other one in six days, it's garbage, but I did it. <laughs> And so like, for me, it was a matter of, number one, when I got my foot in the door, not going, it would have been so easy to be like, you can't make an animation for $7,000 and just walked away from it. But instead I was like, I did this short, I did this short, I did these things. I showed, I showed Ryan Crow a short film that I had made by myself. I was the only one in the room while I filmed it on a weekend that my wife and kids were gone. I was like, I'm gonna shoot this thing. And then they got home Sunday night and I'm like, hey, you guys wanna be in the end of it? And of course, they, you know, they jumped in and it's just this silly movie where I get eaten by a Christmas stocking, it's nonsense. They loved it. Like, it's nonsense to me, but Robert watched it and thought it was super cool because of the fact that it was, we get, oh, sorry. <laughs> there was like pointing and things happening. You're good. I, um, but like, just, just putting it out there when, I, when you have the opportunity. That's the thing, is don't be afraid of those opportunities and don't be afraid to put yourself out there because they don't come that often and when they do, the thing that I find most people are interested in is your, your pure excitement about your project. And that's what's helped me moving forward. And just to, just to kind of wrap up this story of you know, failure to persistence, this whole story started with me going out in the woods to film a movie with my friends and failing miserably at the movie. I'm just wrapping up, I went back after I got off of Rebel and I reshot that movie and we finished it and it's wrapping up in the next couple weeks. So there's something to be said about just persisting and not giving up on something where you're like, it would've been so easy to come home and be like, well, we finished that movie, I guess we wait to see what happens. <laughs> Instead we were like, you know that terrible idea? There's some good in that. How do we make that as good as this one, if not better, and just keep improving on what you've done? I yeah. think that's my time. Yeah. I got one more minute. One more minute. I don't, I don't need my minute. You don't need it? Yeah, uh, yeah I just... Announcing presidency. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take 40 seconds of that just to piece things together. But, um, yeah, that's all amazing stuff. And, like, that, that is the key is, like, even though it's, like, I, I could say be prepared and he, you know, you said you did it in that morning. But it's not that it was the first time you thought about it. And it's, it's the, I've like, just taking that risk. Um, and even the way this is presented, like, 
vomiting teddy bear, whether or not he did it, I'm gonna, it's gonna jump out at me and read it. It's like even picking things that just get the tone of what to expect, the kind of humor to expect. Right. Start painting the picture as soon as possible, whether it's perfect or not, because it won't be. And I played to my audience. When I was putting together this pitch, I was like, what would Robert Rodriguez want to see? Because, you know, most people might go, well, Robert won't look at these. He's going to get 10,000 of these pitches. Right. He'll never see them. Instead, I was like, well, let's pretend like he is going to see it. And what will he like? Yeah. Yeah, it's because, uh, yeah, again, knowing your audience, because this is not, you're not selling, you're not pitching this to people at home on their couch. You're pitching it to people who might buy it or give you money to make it. So be clear about that as well. Um, know who you're pitching to. And if it feels like you're kissing ass, so what? Uh, um, you're, you're, you want, they should, they, you want to walk in and, and that you know their work. Uh, so they want to know New York, like know who you're pitching to, know what they've done in the past. Um, and that's what Josh was doing, knowing um, Robert's stuff so well, you know, even to the point of like, I'm going to put a gun in there because he likes guns. May seem like, you know, an idea thrown out, but it's still a thought. It's still a thoughtful decision to make and didn't second guess it and just did it. Uh, awesome. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so uh, we're going to move on to Tacklebox Attune Company. Take it away, Sarah. Yes, tis I. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, my whole thing is that a lot of my stuff was weirdly fast-tracked. Um, I would say um, my pitch journey started in February, and it's ongoing now, so I'm sort of in the midst of all of it right now. And uh, yeah. So, and also if you want to know something infuriating, I see a billion seams in this. I edited this in the hotel um, maybe five or so hours before the pitch. <laughs> um, so what happened was um, I had received an email from a friend and he said, hey look, um, I've got a buddy at Nickelodeon um, he'd like to talk to you. He likes your work, and he just wants to get in touch. I'm like, ah, okay. Um, yeah, please connect me. Um, this was not really expected. Um, I didn't really have any pitches ready. My plan was I was going to start putting pitches together in July. So I had a really great meeting with um, two development directors at Nickelodeon, they were fairly new, and they essentially said, we want to work with you, how can we work with you? And it's like, <laughs> cool, I have no idea, <laughs> like what do, I, what do you do with that? Um, but what I ended up telling them was, look, I love Minneapolis, I don't want to move, um, but I do have a pitch I might have going. I said, yeah, we'd, we'd love to see that. Um, when can you have it ready? I said, I'll have it ready in a month. Um, so in a month, I uh, just sort of scrambled getting things ready to go, and all I really had ready was um, Brain and Carlos, their designs, and a couple of background characters. Um, so I didn't really have any episodes. I didn't really have a title of the show ready to go. It was sort of like a this or that situation. Um, so yeah. Um. <laughs> so my pitch was um, like 12 slides long. It lasted maybe 15 minutes. Um, and the thing I emphasized and focused on, because I had limited time, was really selling these characters. Because I love Brain and I love Carlos. And I knew I didn't have much time to really, really sell um, like animated content because there was no animated juice to accompany <laughs> it. And also, I'm noticing that her antennae are not in that design. Oh, crap. Um, <clears throat> but that was, it's like, okay, well, what do I have time to do? And what I have time to do is write. And what I have time to do is really, really fall in love with these characters that I already love. Um, and so it became kind of obvious that, okay, I've got these characters, I love them, I gotta sell me. 
and a huge part of the pitching process for me was just being as friendly and cordial and polite as possible because they initially reached out and said, we want to work with you and I want them to still want to work with me. <laughs> um, so even if this pitch is garbage, um, they still want to work with me. Um, so yeah, this is Brain. This is what they saw. <laughs> Um, it was also a really casual sort of thing. Um, this was not projected this big. It was purely digital. I didn't have any printed stuff. Um, yeah, it was just very, not intimate, but it was very buddy-buddy. Uh, <laughs> um, um, like we gave each other hugs and it was really cool. Oh, yeah. I, I pitched on my phone. Oh, no. um, so the next slide is Carlos. Uh, so, yeah, Brain and Carlos and a couple of other things, that was all I had. And, um, okay, well, they look good. Um, so sitting there during the pitch, um, what I ended up doing was um, kind of winging it. I do not suggest doing that because a week later they asked for a transcript of all of the things that I said. <laughs> Um, so I had to record myself at home, winging it again, and transcribe <laughs> that. And that was awful. <laughs> it was the worst. Um, but essentially, it, if you love your characters and you know where they come from and you have solid writing in terms of like the language you're using in the pitch, you, winging it is easy as pie. Like you just know everyone backwards and forwards. And it becomes incredibly sincere and honest. And um, in an industry where selling yourself is, I'm sorry, in an industry, oh, I'm a part of the industry. Um, <laughs> but it, it is, um, selling yourself is as important as selling the content. It really is. And you want it to be as sincere as possible. And even if you are using, um, sort of a branded persona, or you're not giving all of yourself, you still want to come off as someone who isn't phony, um, because these things are coming from you. Um, so, next slide. These were my episodes. Um, I created like a 12 episode list, and I just picked the ones that I thought would be easiest to sell to Nickelodeon. Um, yeah, and they liked them. It was um, weirdly well-received. Um, they loved the redacted episode, which is, I came up with that on the plane. Um, and there's really nothing better than hearing people laugh at things and react to things as you're presenting them and interacting with things and filling in like cracks um, that you purposely left there. Um, but yeah. Um, do I have another slide? I think that's it. I think that's all you have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm famous. gonna like sort of. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Or I've really but got I just wanted, like, Some of the things that you that you brought up are really yeah. great, so I just want to make sure people are are hearing them. Um, the, the idea that they called Sarah, having seen her work, and said, "We want to hire you." And for Sarah to be honest and go, I'm going to stay here, but I do have something to pitch. Take, find, making an opportunity there was great. Um, it's, it showed that, like, yes, I want to work with you, but I have something to bring more than just being an employee. Whatever the case may be, you took an opportunity and made it something. And even though you didn't have it ready, you just lit that fire and got it ready down to the last minute. So making opportunities is a good thing. Um, the idea of pitching in the voice of the show or the voice of the characters, um, if you take time to read any of uh, Sarah's pitch in particular, like, and it's always a good thing that I encourage people to do, is you want to get them into that world as soon as possible. So just your phrasing choices that you use, the, the choice of presenting her episode ideas this way in particular, like I never feel like I've left the world of the pitch for the time I got in. Um, it's... It's, uh, it should be a super fun document. It shouldn't be a cold, uh, you know, business document just yet until, you know, you need, they ask for that thing. 
but it's, it's throwing them into your world as quickly as possible and everything about it um, pointing back to the idea, to the characters. Um, you said, uh, oh, you said about leaving gaps in the conversation, like purposely leaving gaps in the, uh, in the conversation. Was that to encourage conversation? Yeah, um, it was just to allow, just so it wasn't me reading things verbatim from the slides. Great. Um, which is where the winging it thing kind of yeah. happened. You know, it's, it's 9 a.m., you're hopped up on <laughs> L.A. coffee, and, you know, these things just happen. But, um, like, with the setting, the setting takes place in New Mexico, and while I'm pitching it, um, you can hear them whisper, oh, it's like Roswell, oh, yeah, come on. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, and, you know, other various things, like, oh, it's an immigrant story, ah, oh, yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah they did. <laughs> It is. <laughs> um, they also had a gun to my ribs while I was pitching. That was Weird. really scary. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, because I was verbally pitching it, um, I wanted to emphasize me speaking, not the words on mm -hmm. screen. If they're going to look at the screen, I want them to look at images. And if they're going to pay attention to me, I don't want them to just look at me. Yeah. I want them to hear me while they're looking at my slides. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, that's a great way to think about it. That idea of like you don't want to just vomit all of your words at them in like a fever anxiety dream. Like it's about showing and they like, talk the entire time you're there, they're just going to blank out. So that's really good advice to just like allow that breath to happen and allow them to react and respond. Um, it is very much, in our experience, has been it's been a conversation less like a very cold like uh, I'm going to give a presentation because, again, they're getting to know you. So um, be conversational. It's, it's perfectly okay and kind of encouraged because, again, it's about you as a person and your content. Uh, we're good? Time's up. Good. All right. Thank you, Sarah. All right. So uh, now we have uh, John and Andrew who are working together on... Shouldn't you both have a mic? You can. So um, uh, this is a, uh, you guys, this is like sort of the first time you guys put this pitch together, right? Like you've been thinking about it and you're, this is the first you started crafting it into a pitch document. So I wanted to bring them into the idea of, one, they're two friends that are working together and how collaboration works um, to develop an idea and a pitch. And that idea of taking that thing that is fun to talk about with your friends into something workable. So uh, John, Andrew, whatever it is you want to talk about, tell us. Yeah, so, uh, well, yeah, our pitch uh, is called Wasteland. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's like an action comedy series that we had an idea for. Yeah, it's kind of like a, um, a very fun sort of take on, like, you know, kind of Mad Maxy, uh, you know, quality, post apocalyptic kind of thing. Well, we've decided that it's post post apocalyptic. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do that because I like that word. Oh, yeah. Is that in there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, yeah, you can read about it. But um, so I guess as far as like a collaborative effort, um, the work is kind of split just like 50-50 with us. Um, like Andrew initially had the idea yeah. um, in so, college. Yeah, it was originally kind of like a comic, and I was working on it in like junior year at MCAD. I can see a lot of MCAD people here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was just kind of like drawing, it wasn't even an assignment, I was just kind of doing little doodles in my sketchbook, and I was coming up with the ideas over lunch with John, and uh, we were just having a lot of fun coming up with ideas together, and then just so many years later, we, uh, <laughs> we yeah. were like kind of starting talking about pitching, and I was just like, we liked that idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, for, for the longest time, we wanted to keep developing this, this idea that we had a lot of fun with just kind of spitballing characters, settings, scenarios. Um, I mean, we didn't have the main characters initially or anything. It was just funny stuff that could happen yeah. in this environment. Yeah, which is, uh, I suppose I shouldn't uh, trust you guys to just not pay attention to us and not read that. Uh, <laughs> it takes place on a trash island. Uh, and it's just a lot of fun to come up with stuff. 
revolving yeah. around trash, because anything can happen. Yeah, trash is funny. In <laughs> uh, things you throw away is really, really funny. Um, but yeah, we, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I, I think even until like kind of recently, we were thinking of just still making this into a comic, but um, I mean, over the past few years, we've worked on two animated series uh, locally, one for Amazon and one for Netflix. So I think that maybe is what pushed us to think maybe this can be a pitch instead of a comic. Like, we love cartoons. Yeah, we kind of figured it Yeah, we, why not we know enough people we can ask. Uh, we can kind of tell. Uh, we stole Mike's uh, postcard format. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't steal anything. Mike told us to do it. I did tell you. So. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, working in those environments kind of opens a lot of doors. Not like, not really directly, but we know people now, and we have good relationships with people we've worked with in the past, and. Uh, if anything, I think that gives us more confidence to pursue a project like this. Yeah, we, we know some people who made some cartoons. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know some people who we, know we, some people. We, we kind of we know it can be done now, you know? Yeah. Like, we, we've met with creators. We've seen, like, you know, productions happen. It's like, you know, comics are easy because you can, like, I mean, comics aren't easy, but <laughs> <laughs> um, like you, you can just do it all yourself. But like you, you know, just seeing like a cartoon be made, like being a part of it, being it right before you, you kind of you you can know you know it can be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And with that little bit of insight that we got over those productions we worked on, like you said, is especially it being local. We're just like that's a possibility for us. Yeah. Uh, and I, I guess in the end, with that thought, it's like, well, why the hell shouldn't we try doing this? <laughs> yeah. Um, we have ideas. We have a lot of fun just throwing ideas at each other. Um, just remembering to write it down. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just like implementing it into something, making it something that actually exists instead of just making each other laugh, we can make uh, a lot of people laugh. <laughs> can I ask you a question about the, uh, the process of writing, because this is a great paragraph, um, to, uh, like a summary of the show, with uh, like years of thinking about it. Um, can you talk a little bit about your approach to getting this information to read the way you wanted to, 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 to pare this down and simplify it? Oh, that's, that's rough. I feel like it's a lot of, it was a lot of, back and forth and a lot of figuring out, I think initially just like who we want the main characters to be and like who we want yeah. to like take the audience through this journey. Yeah, I mean we kind of treat, we kind of treated this writing like how we treated like the uh, characters and the character designs. We just, one of us would write something and the other would show the other one and be like, well this doesn't make sense here, like you don't need this word. Or, or it's like, oh, I had this idea of what this character would be like, and then the other person would be like, I like that too. Let's yeah. go with that. Sure, why not? Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of our, a lot of this just sprung from those back and forth ideas we had initially, just on what we thought would be funny to happen in this environment. Yeah. And if anything, these characters, like I said, just kind of take you through this journey to encounter all these different scenarios. Yeah. But then once we were like, once we had that thought, then we really had to put the focus into characters that we thought were interesting and that people would care about. Um, yeah, so <laughs> you kind of have like the two main villains on the left and the two heroes on the right. Um, but yeah, uh, I was gonna say something, but right. I forgot. Yeah. Oh, I, I guess uh, it's uh, about collaboration still, uh, working with a partner, um, like on a project, and just being really open to their ideas. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if, if you have a creative partner that you like to work with a lot, um, yeah, just be receptive and just try to incorporate those ideas and mix them with yours 
and trust uh, what they strongly believe in. And yeah, I don't know. You don't want to be butting heads a lot. Like yeah. we're we're just we're just throwing stuff out there and trying to have fun with it, and we don't want to get caught up in just not liking each other's ideas. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't yeah, know. it's, a, it's a liking all of each other's ideas and uh, yeah, just uh, letting the other one just keep what they really really like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're, that, I think that idea of like working with someone is like it's even practicing to pitch your idea because like that idea is like I know this is a good idea. Uh, he's just not seeing it yet. Like, it does, does it take a drawing? Does it take a better phrasing of the way the yeah. thing? Like, it is like, how far do you push it? And then also being willing to, uh, the worst phrase in the world, kill your baby. <laughs> um, uh, being willing to, like, throw away the thing that's been the best thing the whole time if someone else's idea is better. And being, let, not letting your ego stop that from happening. Yeah. And it actually, it seems like it makes ideas that you wouldn't have thought of individually. Um, by by having this process of like what do you think of this what do you think of that new things sprung up uh, the other thing I liked is that you were uh, you were thinking they were thinking about th that main character as who's going to carry you through this world that they knew would be fun laundry listing gags characters locations that's that's a great way to sort of build a world but the fact that they took the thought that like well no one's going to want to It'll, no one's going to want to go on this journey without someone to take them there, without someone to attach to, so that you spent time actually figuring that out is, uh, you know, it's what Sarah was saying too, know these characters because in the end, if you're trying to sell a series, character is what's going to sell it. A novel idea or, or like a clever world or whatever that is cool, but it'll become novelty real fast if people can't empathize with characters. Um, so it's great that all of you are thinking about it from that starting point. Bunch of fun stuff, bunch of great gags, um, but you didn't stop there. Uh, mm. That's what I like to see. Yeah. Um, it's also, just like we got one minute, so oh. whatever else you want to fix. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was gonna, I was gonna say like uh, we're, I mean like we like to joke around. We're pals, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's not like he's my best friend or anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of like a, a a big part of like kind of pitching, not pitching together. But we haven't pitched it yet, but. Like coming up with these ideas together is just like showing each other, or like uh, just saying all the stupid jokes you think of. Like yeah, you get you a get lot of like instant validation. Um, having other eyes on something to yeah. just be like, "Am I crazy? Does this work? Does this make sense?" <laughs> yeah, a lot of these characters, uh, probably at some point, it was just me or John just like laughing over something stupid we drew and show it to each other and be like, oh, that's good, actually. Yeah, this is a funny hat. <laughs> we were trying to come up with a good synopsis, and we, like, wrote a parody of the Mystery Science Theater theme yeah. song. If, if you like want a, 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 a nice, simple template to write a synopsis for a show, just hum the Mystery Science Theater theme in your head and just... Uh, put Plug in, in whatever words. you want yeah. in there. That might be the best advice all night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. That's how uh, we were starting to write in that paragraph. It, 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 now. it really is. Awesome. Uh, all right. Uh, we're wrapped up with those guys. Thank you so much for sharing that. Great stuff. Yeah. Uh, Grace. I'm keeping this. Uh, tell us what you want is this to even on? tell us. Oh, Hi. Really. So, since I'm still a student, I don't have a really cool logo to show any of you. But. <laughs> um, yeah, I started Camp Clementine probably a year ago. Uh, it kind of just started with just a classroom assignment I had for my character design class, and I found some characters that I really, really liked. And then people started asking me, hey, uh, you should probably do something with these guys. I really <laughs> like them. I'm like, oh, you're right. I should do something with these guys. I like them too. Uh, so I came up with this cast of characters. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, they're be they're just bird people. <laughs> um, <laughs> they all work together at a camp, and um, yeah, I, I've had a lot of fun working with these guys. I haven't gotten to the point where I can take this to somebody yet. Uh, I'm still very much learning. Uh, <laughs> I have notes, one second. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought I should like go ahead and start this my senior year because, hey, uh, these things take a long time. Might as well start as early as I can. Uh, so I first had to decide kind of like what kind of show I wanted to make. I decided let's do just a camp show that has a little bit of horror. And 
uh, I wanted to build something that had the potential for complex relationships and stories while also being kind of cliche and fun. Uh, I had some really great advice from Mike saying, uh, <laughs> write what you like because a lot of people are probably going to like it too. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, when I started to like build a pitch, I didn't really have any clue what I was doing. Uh, they don't really teach you how to do it in school, so I was kind of on my own. Uh, so I googled everything. <laughs> uh, I couldn't find a lot of examples online. Uh, so I had to start kind of just building from scratch. Uh, I took an independent study with a teacher, and none of the teachers really knew how to do it either. So we were all <laughs> learning together. Uh, <laughs> but what I did learn was that for a pitch, it's like really important to write in the voice of the show and kind of design your whole thing around what the show would look like and feel. And so I made these little like Polaroid things because that seems campy and I like it. Uh, and then knowing your show is really important as well. So I have this whole other side to Camp Clementine with these goblins that appear uh, once every 30 or so years and come to steal children for some <laughs> ritual. And uh, so it gets complicated really fast. So knowing, <laughs> knowing my story really, really well is super important. Uh, when I do pitch it, it'll be really important. <laughs> um, but yeah, all of it is really hard. I've learned that uh, a good thing to do is if you aren't good at something, find somebody to help you. <laughs> like, uh, we can't all be good at everything. Uh, I'm still learning how to write. <laughs> and so I like to bounce ideas off of anybody I can find. Getting feedback is super helpful. Uh, uh, some people have feedback that doesn't exactly like help you at all. And you're, they're like, oh yeah, how about you just change half of this? Sometimes that doesn't work. <laughs> so you have to kind of take everything with a grain of salt. But um, yeah, uh, people have been super helpful. It's been such a learning curve and everything. But uh, yeah, so I don't know how many of you guys are like students or anything, or like will want to make a pitch for some sort of senior project or whatever. But I guess any like advice that I have for that is, try to use as many opportunities in other classes to work on your pitch as possible. <laughs> uh, my character design final were the characters for this. Uh, my sound design final was the audio for my trailer. <laughs> <laughs> I tried as hard as I could to work it into anything else that I was doing, uh, and that helped a ton. I still have a lot of refining to do before I can take it to somebody, but I'm really, really excited to see where it goes. Uh, that's all I have. <laughs> Where are we at? Five minutes. Okay, I got some things. I'll keep it. I'll keep it rolling here. Yeah. Uh, the um, the one thing you brought up was the not all feedback is necessarily usable, um, which is totally true. Because you, I mean, we're all saying you want feedback, but you also have to have that filter of your own taste and what you're going for. Um, because again, none of us have all of the answers. No one does. Um, so it's that trusted person to give you that feedback and knowing what to do with it. Um, from the experience uh, that we've had with working with networks is, you know, these people are there to give notes and feedback. So if you take some of it and then incorporate that into the next time you show it to them, that shows them that you're listening to them on some level. But if you didn't take all the advice, you can defend it, and then that kind of shows you as someone who believes in their idea as well. So learning how to have that filter of what advice is actually useful for your pitch, you know, just let it sit on it for a minute. Don't panic and say, I have to throw this whole thing out. Um, you might, but then maybe the idea is just a turd. Um, but I think it's just knowing how to take that information and what to do with it and not being that finding that balance between being true to your own idea but not being so stubborn that no one can possibly help you make it better, which is stupid um, and not very true at all. Um, the, uh, the other thing I, was, I liked about the way you said because you were in school and the way you sort of had to plan out how to do it and like making all of your assignments, being smart about the production. So no one is going to ask you to do this pitch and from our experience, no one's going to pay you to do it either. Even if like it's someone else's pitch that everyone wants me to help them with their pitch now, um, and I don't know everything, and I 
anyhow, I don't I feel weird charging. Um, but the point uh, being is plan it like any other job, like any other assignment. If you're going to have a pitch you want to put together and it's like I'm going to put together a 10 page pitch, then t block some time for yourself. Like schedule that like anything else because it's so easy for personal projects and ideas as you all probably know to flit away because you're trying to get the next job or you're, you know, paying your bills and all the stuff we have to do to live. But just schedule it like anything else and be smart about how you use your time even if it is, like Sarah was saying, in the Uber or the Lyft ride over for the pitch, making edits to the thing, Josh waking up in the morning going, oh shit, I guess I should take a photo. Um, just uh, whatever time you have, be smart about it, treat it like a real thing. Um, don't let it flit away because it'll, time will pass by really fast and your idea might already be out there in the world. It, it's best to get it out there as soon as possible um, and allow yourself um, to be productive and set yourself clear milestones, um, which we'll talk about with the template to even give you that starting point. Um, whether it's a one page pitch or a 15 page pitch, make that decision um, and hit that mark. It's still more than nothing. Doing a postcard is more than never having a pitch and keeping it to yourself. Um, you can start sharing that idea and hope it, and it might cross the path of someone who really wants to see it. But you have to be ready and available. Uh, yeah, those are the things I had on yours. Where are we at on time? We have two minutes. Anything, any parting words, uh, Grace? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. All right, cool. Uh, well, thank you so much, Grace, for sharing. Do you want to be up here? All right, uh, so Hegel has a three-hour presentation for you. <laughs> so everybody stand up. Sorry, it's the, uh, the incurable college professor in me. I overprepared a, a lecture. But I love uh, when people can, can have a takeaway, something that they can actually start working on. So unlike uh, Grace's experience, I actually do teach this in my classes. So th these are like about four things, I think, where if you took them home and actually started working on them, you could uh, make the wheels start spinning, which is uh, good. Um, all of those things that uh, Wendy and Mike were talking about, about shortening the idea in such a way that it still communicates the idea, is something that I'm really passionate about, so I want to kind of hit on two things that I stole from John Truby, author. Uh, one is the designing principle and one is the log line, which you guys have undoubtedly heard of. But the designing principle is, is uh, sort of a mission statement for the creator, so that they can look at um, the scope of what they want to do and sort of categorize it for themselves and answer not only what is it to other people, but what is it to themselves. Um, think of it as story process plus what makes it original, what makes it a, a different thing than we've seen before. So I like Road Warriors, one of my favorites, a uh, long time. It's basically a Western, right? A lone hero comes to the aid of an embattled village, but you just switch it. The horses are cars and boom, just go make it. So now you know I can follow all those Western tropes and I'm good to go. Uh, we throw in post-post-apocalyptic and it makes it better. Uh, it, more, more contemporaneously here, uh, the chilling adventures of Sabrina. I watched the pilot, I try to watch the pilot of everything. It gets you a little sample and you don't waste a whole bunch of time digging deep. Uh, I categorize it as a teen drama, like a CW kind of drama, but it happens to be exorcist era, which already my, you know, whoa, my brain is going, okay, exorcist era, all right. That, uh, Rosemary's Baby, okay. In a generically retro small town, mm -hmm, I can feel that. And it just, if you happen to know Riverdale, then you understand kind of the, the vibe that it's going for. Uh, by the way, Riverdale is Twin Peaks with Archie Jughead, <laughs> Betty and Veronica. I watched the pilot of that and I went, God, this feels a lot like David Lynch. Uh, very dark, very dark. Kind of, it's kind of a brilliant way to handle that property, I think. Um, but the designing principle lets you narrow your field because if you want to make a thing, suddenly everything could work, but narrowing the field allows you to focus and go, all right, I can throw out some of this stuff. I don't need to work in that area. What are my archetypes and tropes and conventions that work with those things that I'm talking about? So if I say Blue Velvet and Twin Peaks, and in fact, uh, one of the Riverdale episodes is uh, titled Firewalk With Me. So they're, they're wearing it on their sleeve, obviously. They, they know what they're doing. And uh, by the time they get through the machinations of making that thing, even if it is a copy of that, it's not going to feel like a copy. I don't think any 14-year-old kid is going, boy, I'm watching my Riverdale. It sure seems a lot like David Lynch. I don't know why, but there it is. 
So what, if you have that, then you can start doing some of those other things that you need to do. And one of those is, I saw that everybody had kind of a, a thick paragraph, and that you need to be there too, but somewhere along the way, you only have a sentence to get somebody where maybe it's on the front of the postcard. Uh, okay, what is it really about? What is it? And the log line is that opportunity. I, I like a, a log line that gives you a hook, that makes you go, oh, like, oh, tasty. Uh, that's emotionally intriguing. Uh, a book cover that tempts you to open it. So um, here, here's my formula for it. This is stolen from a lot of different places, but if it's something where you can indicate the time frame that it's occurring in, like uh, it happens in a week, it happens overnight, it's Frodo crossing the, the Middle Earth, it's gonna take a while. Indicate a time frame. Uh, conflict is the big thing. Everything has to have some conflict. The formula, protagonist plus desire plus obstacle. Desire doesn't have to necessarily be overt, but you can understand it from the content. If this is this kind of character, we can kind of, uh, yeah, probably if he's feeling that way, that's likely to be his desire. We don't have to say it out loud. Um, it might be nice if we can suggest what the audience for the show is. Um, but, and this is Truby, a compelling mental picture blooms in your mind when you hear the log line. It's a, it's a nice phrase. So uh, I, th I think this is a great one. A New York City cop, that's a very specific image, right? It's different than a Minneapolis cop. Travels to LA, okay, that's different than him traveling to Omaha to visit his estranged wife at Christmas, but terrorists attack the company party. You've got an obvious time frame. It's a party, it's probably not three days, it's probably a day. Protagonist, desire, what's his desire? It's kind of built into that, his estranged wife. You can hear it, and that's that reducing, and then you guys had to fight that to find the really strong words that said everything you needed to as quickly as you can. Anybody see this, Cobra Kai? on YouTube, I was, I, as a kind of a Karate Kid guy, I, it's kind of amazing. So here's my reverse engineered logline for it. 34 years later, Daniel LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence reignite their karate-fueled feud, but the lines between good guy and bad guy are no longer as clean cut now that they're middle-aged. And if you watch it, um, the first thing you realize is, John, Johnny is, he's kind of like a good guy, he's not the bad guy, he's, He's got layers, and oh, my, I was very excited, very excited by that. I, my world was turned inside out. He, oh my God, he's, got, he's sympathetic. So with all of the things that one has to produce for a pitch, it can get really easy to get swept away by all those sort of details of all the, I had to make characters, I gotta make episodes. But I think that killer idea, in addition to having great characters, is something that probably helps it float above the other stuff in the market. And certainly a lot of bad ideas get made, but those tend not to stick around, right? Here's some ideas for people who uh, maybe aren't making an animated show and are doing something live action. It's, it's harder to, say, visualize what your characters are gonna be, to visualize what scenes are going to be. So um, I took a, my master's degree from a guy who uh, worked as a pre-visualization guy for uh, Warner Brothers and Marvel doing a bunch of things and I learned that there's a lot of things you can get away with sort of legally um, in terms of taking people's stuff and repurposing it as a communication tool. So I'm going to talk about um, sort of concept art real quick. Uh, maybe, okay, you're a great artist, you can paint it, fantastic. But um, a lot of people at this stage can use things like photo manipulation. Here's my buddy Troy, oh, you can almost see him, getting molested by uh, his friend Charles. And this is just something we went out and shot an image of and we did a, a simple paint over. So you're getting a lot of stuff out of the way quick. You're getting environment, you're getting costume, stuff that we could whip together, much like Josh's, I'm gonna grab whatever's in the living room and photograph this with just maybe an extra half hour or hour <laughs> instead of rushing to work and we do a little paint over. Uh, same here again with friend Kelly. Um, this isn't a green screen, this is just a, a wall that happens to have turned green when we threw a green light on her. So we didn't even have a green screen, so you don't need it. Um, the current thing I'm doing is uh, puppets, monsters, kind of adult comedy, and there's a, a, an extended uh, plot line involving uh, it's kind of a convoy slash uh, cannonball run slash speed racer ripoff. So how do you il illustrate that quickly? So I grabbed a couple of photos of uh, 
semi trucks and put the characters in it. And um, because I drove back and forth to work in the the, ble the blazing snow all winter, uh, being nearly crushed by semis, it really it it seeped into the work a little bit. <laughs> this is this is 94 uh, Highway 94 for for weeks on end. Uh, the other thing, though, is uh, video. So uh, I was surprised to learn from Peter, the guy that I had taken the class from, that there's something called a ripomatic. Have you guys heard of this? So a ripomatic is I just take some stuff from other shows, some other movies, and I put them together, and they, they become a new thing because you've uh, because of that great association of imagery, when you can take a thing and a new thing, and it becomes a brand new thing because of it. So for my thesis, I did um, one of these, and I took stuff from a whole bunch of different shows, Dark City, Sorcerer's Apprentice, just things that kind of had a 30s vibe to it, a magic vibe to it, and a Hong Kong vibe to it, and ended up with a minute and a half trailer that um, really looked like a finished thing. And you could go, well, hey, those are Nicolas Cage's hands, and you could go, well, that's Alfred Molina, clearly he's not in your movie, but the, the essence of it was you could kind of smell it. Like that's, okay, that's what that thing is gonna be. And I'm gonna point you in the direction of this, we don't have to watch it here, but uh, Joe Carnahan used this technique to pitch a studio version of Daredevil, you can see the day on it, 2012, um, a hard R slash NC-17, you know, Joe Carnahan, um, using imagery from uh, 70s films like uh, various martial arts films and Taxi Driver, and then even some shots of the Ben Affleck uh, Daredevil made to look like 70s stuff. And it's a kind of a kick-ass reel. Uh, so if you get a chance, that's on YouTube. Just to show that it works, and um, I still kind of wish that that was the version that was made. It's pretty neat. So all of these things that we do to clarify the pitch are things that not only help us to communicate it to others, but in the case of guys like Josh and me, or even if you guys start actually making this stuff, and, you know, Grace, if you dig in and have to do your show, you now have gone through some of these steps and clarified it further for yourself. And if it doesn't, if you can't pitch it to yourself and have it work, then you're probably not ready to start making stuff. As a filmmaker for too long, I've often started things and didn't really put it through the sieve like I should have. And this is now, I know, if I can't communicate it in that sentence, it's probably not worth going to the trouble to do it. So. Uh, awesome. Uh, well, that was awesome. Um, thanks for uh, being the teacher who teaches this. Uh, I'm sure everyone appreciates that. Um, no, really good stuff to think about. And I'm glad you brought up actually like, because like, everything has here has been animation because that's the world I live in. Um, so just the idea of live action, you still have to pitch it and those tools I wouldn't have thought up. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so uh, I'm gonna run through this template. Um, so that's everyone's stories. Um, I wanna leave you with uh, two other things. This template that Wendy and I put together based off of our experience working with everyone from uh, PBS uh, to Apple to uh, some what's horror comic that we're currently working on. So it, uh, and a kid show about food and ukuleles and like it runs the spectrum. So we sort of gave this general starting point pitch um, which will make, uh, we'll make a PDF available on Nice Move's site. Is that cool? Can we do that? So people can have a starting point. But I'll just walk through it right now. Um, so if you don't even know where to start, this can be a very fill-in-the-blank sort of approach. Um, so show title, pretty easiest, and your contact information. Uh, it's your splash page, it's your movie poster, um, it's, the, it's the book cover that gets them, to get you to read the book. Um, table of contents, I've seen some people use it and not, it depends on your, how long and involved the pitch is. I've done pitches where like, we did the postcard pitch and the next time we did a 10 page pitch. And so as it grows, because every, every pitch that you do, you always want to end the meeting if it seems like it's going well, is what's the next step? And they might say, write a script or give me a, flesh this out a little bit more. Um, so if you get to the really fleshing out a Bible, um, this is based on uh, something we saw, we worked with um, a friend who is doing a project with PBS. Uh, they shared this this long format. So if you have enough of material, um, table of contents can't hurt. Yeah, and this is also for uh, a pre preschool shows. All require a lot of yeah. A lot that's more yeah. Pages. There's there's things in here that are for like 
pre anything preschool or educational, they have a lot of uh, qualifications that you have to hit um, and you have to communicate clearly. So we put that in here, but know that if you're, if you're pitching, uh, you know, some sort of zombie, uh, I don't know, destruction movie, you may not need it. Um, so, uh, we, and if you have your, just like sort of a title card, so what is this show? So as he goes talking about your log line, what is summing up in that one sentence? Um, uh, have artwork in there, make it all, again, you saw in Grace's stuff where like the Polaroids or just little pictures of canoes, you know, the, you were always in the world, so dress it up, don't let it be boring, but the idea is like, what is this show? Give it to me right now because these executives or whoever you're pitching to has to sell it up the ladder to their people so they want bite-sized, easily digestible information that they can share as well. Um, so start there. Uh, give them a, a plot. Um, this is sort of just going to be what happens in it. You know, it's, it's uh, a guy that's been sent to the garbage planet for his crimes, whatever, <laughs> however you guys word it. So just give us an idea of what it is that we're, what's going to happen. Um, again, just keep it simple, find those right words. Um, less is more, good imagery that puts people in the mood of the show and the tone of the show. Uh, a page about theme, so what is this about? You know, it's a show, um, uh, like we're working on one, it's a uh, monkey and car, and it's, it's about a monkey and a car become best friends so they can travel to the moon, but really it is, it's about this old, this old man who's alone and finally has a reason um, to, to have one more chance to be the person he was supposed to be. So what is the underlying uh, passion and the theme? What, why are you telling this story? Whether uh, Sarah's story, their story, there are immigrant stories about what that experience is like. Um, wasn't what you started with, um, but it wasn't sort of like what you wore on your sleeve there, but it comes across in the way that she's presenting the ideas. People are picking up on that. So uh, what happens? What is it about? And also the words on here, obviously not. Yes, they're uh, just lorem ipsum, yeah. so pay no but, attention but to that. But you don't, don't feel like you have to put words on every page either. Right. Like you've like got it's, like yeah, an image this, that can tell that story. Yeah, these better. are like block like none of this is like you have to put your text on the le on the left side or Amazon will kick you out. It's nothing like that. Um, but it's the idea of like a block of information. It could be one line or a phrase that the character says. Um, what like I we used a lot of just Philip isms in the in this uh, danger and eggs pitch that really worked because how he talked mattered uh, and it sold the character. Um, so it could just be it was the Philip pitch is like you know they're an odd pair and Philip saying something weird. Um, but it worked. Uh, so you have what it's about. Um, now let's just talk about your characters. Again, characters are so key to attach people to a show and want to keep watching it. Um, and there's various, you can have various sort of tiers of your character. Um, I, you know, starting with the main character, there's almost always that one hero, even if it's a duo. But if it's definitely like a Danger and Eggs was definitely a duo, then that's how we presented it. Um, so, again, doesn't feel like you have to separate it, but we kind of need to know who that hero is in the story. Who's your protagonist? Um, who are we going to follow through the garbage dumps? Um, so if you have a co-star, you can go to that character or put them together if they're sort of secondary. Um, it's, I mean, if you think about it too, like The Simpsons, like Bart was the main character when it started, but now everyone thinks of Homer first when they think of The Simpsons. So even if things evolve and things change or characters like Maria is not going to be exactly, is that the name of the character? Like it was described in Josh's original pitch, she was still in place in some way to get a, a scope of who we're going to see. Um, then you could start branching out into secondary characters, whether they're circles of friends or the neighbors or the boss. Um, you can start grouping things together. Maybe it's, you know, it's the chess club or it's the, you know, the guys that work at the gas station. Those second, you just think of it as concentric rings of like your main character and those as your, your own circles of friendships, like how those relationships, um, who is at the core of your friendship and who are people you just are acquaintances or peripheral, but they're key to the story. Um, again, this is not a, hunt, is a template, but not Bible. Um, and those blue squares just like put some artwork of those characters in there. Uh, uh, then environments, the world, what is this world going to be at? Is it going to be New Mexico? Is it going to be a summer camp? Um, so what is our main location? Uh, is it the is Simpsons house? Is it, uh, is it Moe's bar? Like there's, you think of all the locations in Simpsons, um, the house is probably the main place. Um, think of your second one, whatever that sort of 
you know, you'll think of more as more stories come on, but like I want, as I'm selling an idea, give me an idea of am I going to be in a 1930s uh, speakeasy uh, or am I going to be in a 7-Eleven because there's, there's different tones for different things. If you can make those two things work, even better. Uh, so just, you know, I, we narrowed it down to sort of like three basic locations. Um, places we go, that could be other potential stories, other possibilities of where, where this world could be. Is it just a landscape of uh, this never-ending uh, Adventure Time sort of world? There's the Ice Castle, there's all these other things that could be there. Um, and then the format, this one is definitely one that was a little bit more for the preschool. They, for PBS in this preschool show, they literally wanted to know a general breakdown of what was going to happen almost every second. So if it's a 22 minute show and you know the from minute one to minute two uh, the character starts their day and Lily starts her day and then three to four um, she meets a new friend and they come across the problem. So it's, it's so they know how it's going to be structured. Um, we haven't pitched anything like that so we haven't used it too much but we're working with a guy who has done this um, and it was, a, it was one of those things he pitched to PBS and they said it would be really nice to see this kind of thing so they gave him um, a sample pitch of what they're looking for because he asked for it but in, because he was in the room starting the conversation he had no way of knowing that this is what they were looking for but he had enough to be in the room and find out that oh for this particular show and this particular network you, they need this. Um, example stories almost inevitably if you're selling a series should be in there. You don't necessarily need the format but example stories um, like Sarah was showing these little premises and like you may never do them. They may never be part of it but they if they have a good title they have like a quick little you know one sentence two sentence at best like what happens what are the stakes um, who's in it where are they at whatever it might be it's if you watch Netflix and that little descriptor that is beside every show of what it's about you, look at that for a format of how to write the thing. Um, would you watch an episode based on that description? So like Josh was saying of vomiting teddy bear, those words that jump out at you and like I don't know what this is about but that's I want to see that happen. Um, and you do if you've seen this vomiting teddy bear, it's amazing. Um, uh, educational benefits is another if you're doing a direct educational show. So we're working on a preschool show about um, food, food sharing, where food comes from, and um, educational programs work with schools and work with educators directly, and they want to sort of know what are these educational milestones that you're going to be hitting in your show. Um, there's a, it's, it's not just wacky stuff of characters, characters yelling jokes at each other. I stole that from Sarah because that's my favorite thing. Because um, there's so many shows that are just characters yelling jokes at each other. Um, so if you, if you have a show that is a preschool show or an educational based show, start looking into um, there's, there's the, who's attached to it. Can you talk to an educator who's in? If you're doing something about um, depression or anxiety, get some, someone to really help back that up because you, you don't want to put something frivolous in there if you're trying to educate people. Um, we have, you know, there's a chef attached to this, uh, a food writer attached to this show that we're working on about food. Um, just to sort of give us that insight and that cred of we're working with someone who really knows this stuff, um, working with teachers who really know this stuff. So again, uh, it's an optional page, but it's, if you're pitching that type of thing, uh, it's nice to have it in there. Uh, team bios, again, if everyone keeps saying this is about work, who you're selling yourself, you're making a relationship between a network um, and your team of people. <coughs> Uh, so put that out there like it's you know the the credits of what you've done matter they want to know who's going to be who they're going to be working with like what have they done before what is their sensibility so I think just who is your core team it might just be two people doing the pitch um, but it might be two people and an educational advisor because you're doing a show about math um, uh, you might have someone attached to it that's uh, someone's already going to do a voice that's really famous and people and executives love when there's famous voices attached to a cartoon. So anything that you feel is like that core team, um, whether it's the, the painter you're working with because their style is just going, is nailing this, um, so I'm bringing their work into it. Or I've worked with this person before, they made this short film that did really well. Whatever it might be, um, you're selling yourself and your team uh, as well as the idea, so don't be afraid to sort of um, 
put that badge on there and like don't feel like you're being arrogant about it or it's you know you don't have the best headshot in the world draw a picture of yourself it doesn't matter um, but just give them an idea of who you are and what you've done and then close it out with another uh, the same it could be the same end title a thank you for watching thank you for looking um, so you just have nice bookends to package it like a sandwich all together uh, and always contact information so when they look at it again they can find you um, so that's the template uh, in general again not um, gold not hundred percent you have to do it exactly that way but if you have trouble getting started um, it's a great way to start filling in the blanks um, so the reason that uh, one of the reasons that we decided to put this panel together um, was inspired by this idea of this catalyst festival that's coming to Duluth in October um, so it's a festival for, it was originally called the Independent Television Festival um, because there's, rare, there's hardly any avenues for independent series creation or television creation as, there, as much as there are independent film festivals and ways to market and sell your film. So Catalyst is trying to do that for episodic series work. They were based in LA for about five years. They were in Vermont for about five years. Vermont was uh, the, they weren't supporting the arts very much or supporting them in Vermont. So they were on a hunt for where to go next. And Minnesota, uh, for all of its good and bad, has actually been really supportive of this sort of thing, um, of this kind of event happening here. And we have, you know, we're trying to increase the, the rebates to bring productions here and bring some attention to all the work that is being created and the talent that is here. Um, this Callus Festival could be a, potentially be a really good opportunity for all of us um, to start showing the kind of things that we're making here, because um, they have a submission policy or policy. They have a submission platform um, for a pilot, and most of this has been live action for this festival. And, and Wendy and I talked to him. It's like, well, how does animation fit into this? Does it? And he said, absolutely. Producers are always asking for animation, and no one has any at this festival. No one comes with it. They're thinking only live action. So our devious plan is to flood them with as much stuff as possible. Um, and so we wanted to at least get, have a kickoff starting point and people to start thinking about this stuff. The, the deadline is June 30th, 31st, which is crazy. It used to be they, they gave us an extra month. I don't know if I told you that, Josh. Okay, they gave us an extra month. Uh, well, they gave everybody, not just us, but they, because they kind of, this, like, we just somehow found out about it through, you know, different email newsletters that we get. So it kind of, like, landed on Minnesota, and it's happening, and they want pitches, and I don't know how many people are knowing about it yet, so we decided to take it upon ourselves to go meet the executive director of it, tell him that we're, you know, we want nice moves to be a part of it, we want animation to be a part of it, and he was very excited and very supportive. So go to this Catalyst Festival. Uh, Catalyst content or ITV Fest, it still links that way. And just look at the submissions and look what they're, they're um, taking. So it's pilots, which was the thing, and they, they're like, just give us your finished pilot. And I was like, that is not how animation usually works. Uh, so, but he said there's also, there's a category to submit pitches, um, scripts, and podcasts, right? Um, was there any other ones that you saw in there? That was it, right? The pitches, yeah. And the pitches are by genre. Yes, which is very interesting to me because it's like usually like there's the animation category and there's a the live action category. This is like comedy, drama, whatever. So use that. Put it in like there's almost, um, it's kind of nice because animation does tend to get shoved in a corner um, as like, oh, isn't that cute what those guys are doing? <laughs> um, so I kind of like this format where like you want to, you want a drama? How about an animated drama? Do you want a comedy? How about an animated comedy? And it's, so the process is going to be you submit online, they narrow it down, and at the event you're going to be on stage pitching, I don't on stage, but in a room pitching your idea, and there's going to be executives from HBO and Netflix and Showtime and all these places as the audience members. So it's a really, it's a rare opportunity um, to pitch in that format because, you know, like I, I, I had this opportunity to pitch and get into the room because I won an Emmy. So like, that's my advice. Everybody won an Emmy, then you can get a meeting um, 25 years later. Um, so this, this kind of like open door, if you've got it, let's try, put it out there. Um, you guys should really take advantage of it. Good or bad, and this is why we're calling this failure and persistence, good or bad, uh, perfect or not perfect, um, 
make it, get it out there. And so we wanted this to be sort of a kickoff point if you've been hesitating or thinking about it. Um, really try, because this is going to be in Duluth for at least five years, um, which is huge. So I think it's important we start the first year by uh, where Minnesota is not just here to like help facilitate everybody else, like we're also creators. And that's the image I want to paint at this festival. So um, if you've got something, if you've got something finished, live action animation, just look at this website and see what's available. If you had ideas, it's a good chance to just throw it against the wall and see if it sticks. Worst case scenario, you, you go to the event anyhow in Duluth, there's screenings, there's gonna be parties, there's gonna be um, executives and development people just floating around you know, these parties in Duluth and half the time most of our really good connections came from drinking next to somebody from Netflix. Uh, it's amazing what that can do. So highly recommend putting stuff together, pitching it, whatever it might mean. Um, go to this festival, show them what Minnesota can do and what's possible. Um, and just, because we need, I think this, what's great about Nice Moves is building this community of people. That's how it's going to work and this is, could potentially be a really great uh, launching point and opportunity for all of us. So um, that's it. Where are we at on overall time? 8.30, is that the end, 8.31? Yeah. All right, so no questions and answers then? Because I don't want to overstay the welcome, but um, people probably do, do we have. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> people want to finish the pizza. Uh, okay. Well, you know, there's. Uh, yeah. Do you have contact info? Uh, yes. Um, uh, I have some. I have a few business cards I can hand out if you really want them. Um, but just uh, for now, Mike at Mike Owens Productions, you can email me uh, if you have specific questions. If you guys, it's up to you whether you want to give out your information or not. I'm not going to force that on anybody. But again, this is a community of people, nice moves. We can all find each other, um, reach out. Like, same thing Grace was saying, like you find that person that's, that's doing the good thing. Don't be afraid to have that conversation. Um, but uh, we'll try to answer the best we can. Um, for the most part, just you know, make things um, and then fail at it and make it again. Uh, that's it, thanks. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. That was really awesome. I know we kind of ran out of time. We started a little bit late, but uh, if you if you kind of missed something, like Mike said, you know everyone's faces now, and um, they're all really nice. And thank you to Nick, our our timekeeper. <laughs> and thank you. I know I've. There's a lot of people I've seen before, but a lot, a lot of people I've never seen before. So thank you to both new friends and old, and thank you to MTN. Uh, it would not be possible without the space, without this equipment. And uh, yeah, let's just finish the pizza, and we'll, some people will probably hang out at Tattersall, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you.